With winter less than two weeks away, it's the perfect time for some island hopping to a tropical spot. Say the spot where a fabulously wealthy woman assembled a unique collection of art. Connor Knighton is our guide. Situated on nearly five acres of oceanfront property in Honolulu, Hawaii, the colorful gardens of this stunning, serene estate are hidden behind walls of solid white. From the street, you can't even catch a glimpse. And that was precisely the point. I think that Doris came here for privacy. She was, I don't want to say hounded, but people were certainly interested in her life and her money. Leslie Mickelson is the curator of the Shangri-La Museum of Islamic Art, Culture, and Design. But before Shangri-La was a museum, it was a home, the private residence of an intensely private heiress. Doris Duke was once known as the richest girl in the world. Born in 1912, she was the only child of James Buchanan Duke, founder of the American Tobacco Company and benefactor of Duke University. When James died in 1925, Doris was just 12 years old. He left her a massive fortune. Although Doris did her best to stay out of the limelight, the press documented her every move, including her surprise wedding to James Cromwell in 1935. The couple immediately left the country on an almost year-long trip around the world. The Colonel of Shangri-La was, was really born on, on the honeymoon trip, and we know that because Doris was very taken with her time in South Asia. She was very taken by the Mughal architecture that she experienced there, especially the Taj Mahal. When the Cromwells finally arrived in Honolulu, intended to just be a brief stopover, they decided to stay and build their own Taj Mahal-inspired structure here. Hawaii offered privacy and a relaxed pace of life. Shangri-La was designed by Marion Sims Wyeth, the same architect who designed Mar-a-Lago. Although Duke divorced Cromwell shortly after construction was completed, she spent the rest of her life traveling back and forth to Hawaii, tweaking Shangri-La. Well, Shangri-La is the only house that Doris actually built. She inherited the rest of her homes, and this is the one that she developed according to her own taste and preferences. The interior of Shangri-La is a mismatch of centuries and styles, incorporating elements from Duke's travels throughout the Islamic world. So in this hallway, we have one of our most celebrated artworks. This is our mihrab, or prayer niche. This rare lusterware prayer niche was made in Iran in 1265. It's just around the corner from a room draped in bright blue fabric made in India in the 1960s. Duke collected everything from 16th century calligraphy to 18th century jewelry. Doris wasn't collecting what other people were collecting, even within the boundaries of Islamic art. She was collecting things that nobody else was collecting. And that unique collection forms the basis of what's now the Shangri-La Museum. When Duke died in 1993, she left behind part of her billion dollar fortune to establish the Doris Duke Foundation for Islamic Art. Single most important element of Islamic art would be the calligraphy. Today, calligraphy. tours of Shangri-La are sold out months in advance. The museum has started an artist in residence program, inviting contemporary Islamic artists to study and work in Duke's former home. What was once the most private of retreats is now meant to serve the public. It's one of just a handful of Islamic art museums in the United States. Well, I think especially in the current socio-political climate, I think that the arts and cultures of the Islamic world are poorly understood. And I think that that's something that Shangri-La can offer to the public. We can be your point of, point of entry to this, this very rich and wonderful world. A rich, wonderful world that once captivated the richest girl in the world.